hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Jeff Katz. I'm the executive director at Road of Shalom. Welcome to part two of our Cook and Connect series featuring world-renowned chef Adina Sussman. I want to mention some thinking that led us to ask Adina to share her experience about living in Israel through her lens as an American Jew. As the intensity and duration of the pandemic became clear, we wanted to bring our community together. We discovered Adina and her passion for eclectic Israeli cuisine and what it can represent. We knew we had found a highly approachable, thoughtful and engaging individual. Creating this connection with each other, building on the cultural and culinary bridges Adina identifies is what this Cook and Connect series is working to accomplish. And we have the privilege of experiencing the vibrancy that is Adina Sussman. This morning, Adina will first teach us how to make a tahini smoothie and then in the main interview, moderated by our congregant and past president, Fred Strober, Adina will discuss how food is a creative tool which can speak to our identity and bridge cultural differences. We encourage you to submit questions and comments during the program in the chat. And as time permits, they'll be incorporated into the interview. We're happy to see everyone virtually and spend this time together. We're especially grateful to each of you, our generous supporters for making a meaningful contribution to RS and for your philanthropic participation. Without the commitment of the following people and organizations, we could not be here this morning. Thank you to the Joseph W. Rosenbluth Fund, to our corporate sponsors, First Trust Bank, Intech Contractors, Divine Brothers, CCS Fundraising, Goldstein's Rosenberg's Raphael Sachs Funeral Home, and to our Cook and Connect series patrons and event patrons, to everyone who has philanthropically participated. You make this possible. We want to give thanks to our philanthropy committee members for their dedication. Ivy Barsky, Bonnie Breyer, Jonathan Broder, Rachel Collins Clark, Eric Dickstein, Chip Ellis, Mike Houtman, Jill Ivy, Jonathan Klein, Deborah Clare, Monica Kramer, Jonathan Krauss, Ellen Poster, Mickey and Ellen Simon, and Fred Strickland. We are to thank Rabbi May with Rabbi and Ken Essman, our Rabbis Emeriti Fuchs and Kuhn, our President Hank Bernstein, Dina Horowitz, Alyssa Geller, Marcia Biggs, our Tech Angels, Danny Castillo and Ned Hanover, and others working behind the scenes. You should have received your virtual program via email. If you want to locate it during the program, a link is in the chat box. If anyone wants to follow Adina's tahini smoothie cooking demo in real time, we encourage you to find the recipe and instructions in the chat. We have put a link to Adina's book, Sababa, in the chat box if anyone, if anyone feels moved to purchase it after the program. And some notes when we begin. Now, please remember to stay muted, submit questions in the chat box. This cooking demo and conversation will continue until roughly 11.30, and thank you. And so now I would like to introduce Rabbi Jill Maderer for a Devar Torah. Thank you, Jeff, for your leadership today and your leadership throughout pandemic life and throughout congregational life. Gratitude to all of you for remaining connected and supportive of our sacred congregation now more than ever. In the Torah, when the Israelites flee Egypt, they are described as an Erev Rav, a mixed multitude. In every generation, today included, there is no one Jewish story. There is no one Jewish practice no one Jewish interpretation, no one Jewish race, and certainly no one Jewish food, and no one Israeli food 
Jewish and beyond. What a joy it is today to celebrate Israel and Judaism's many flavors with our guest, Adina Sussman, and led by our beloved past president, Fred Strober. And what could be more authentic than an early morning gathering to help transport us to Israel's time zone? I look forward to our trip to Tel Aviv today. Good to be together. Thank you, Rabbi Maderer. And now it's my pleasure to introduce, to introduce our moderator, Fred Strober. Fred is a longtime and beloved member of Road of Shalom. Fred was our president from 2008 to 2011, and he has a large extended family in Israel. He spent a year there during and after the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Since then, he's visited many times and has seen the evolution of the food scene. A lawyer with the firm Saul Ewing Arnstein and Lair LLP, Fred continues his synagogue involvement on many fronts, including the Board of Advisors and the Finance, Philanthropy, and Endowment Committees. Fred. Jeff, thank you very much. Um, and I'm just thrilled to be here this morning, moderating the, this program um, with our wonderful guest, Adina Sussman. Adina is the author of the book, Sababa. You've seen it on our screen. Fresh, sunny flavors from my Israeli kitchen. A book which in the, uh, won the best fall 2019 cookbook award from the New York Times, Bon Appetit, and Food and Wine. Adina is right now working on a follow-up to Sababa, which is all about the foods of Shabbat. She's the co-author of 11 cookbooks and three collaborations recently with Chrissy Teigen um, have um, uh, been books that have made the New York Times bestseller list. A native of Northern California, Adina traveled to Israel extensively, fell in love with the country's food culture for over 20 years of visits. And in uh, 2018, she became a citizen and she today lives in Tel Aviv in the shadow of that city's Carmel market with her husband, Joel Shofet. I've had the pleasure of meeting Adina uh, before today and visiting her in the sunny kitchen that you're about to see. I'll tell you that the word sababa means everything is awesome. And in her book, Adina writes about the quote, insanely delicious and incredibly diverse culture of Israeli food. Well, Adina is the personification of that culture. And as she shows you how to make a tahini milkshake or <laughs> a, tahini, a tahini smoothie, um, she'll welcome you into her kitchen. After she makes her presentation, she and I will engage in a short dialogue about Israeli food and about her experience. And we'll be happy to take your questions you, that you can put into the chat. Two degrees. Thank you very much. So with that, Hi. I'll, I'll turn this over to Adina in sunny Tel Aviv. Hi. Hi, it's so nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It was sunny until about 20 minutes ago when the sun set to my right. Um, I wish I could pan you to, so you could see uh, the, the spire in Jaffa and the sunset overlooking the water. Um, I hope to see you all in Israel soon, but in the meantime, it's great to see you here today. and. Um, I've had so much fun getting to know Fred and Jeff and the whole Rodef community. And I really hope that in my next visit to see Michael Salamanov, who is a dear friend of mine and who wrote the introduction to Sababa, I get to visit your shul and get to meet all of you in person. But in the meantime, I wanted to transport you to Israel with one of the easiest and most uh, delicious recipes in Israel that I think really speaks to what's so exciting about Israeli food right now. Okay, so we're gonna make a smoothie. Um, I'm gonna be having breakfast for dinner since it's about quarter to six here. So you guys can have it for brunch, but the star ingredient here is what we call Israel's mother sauce, uh, tahina. And um, tahina or tahini, regardless of how you pronounce it, is simply uh, sesame seeds that are roasted, soaked in water, sometimes salt water to remove the outer hull, run through a centrifuge to remove that tougher hole and then 
uh, ground into this magical elixir that has become one of the staple ingredients of Israeli cooking and has become popular all over the Middle East and the world. Um, this is Har Bracha Tahina. What I love about uh, the Tahina culture in Israel, and it is a culture, is that all of the best brands are made by Arabs and Palestinians, and they're all bought by Jews happily. And it's one of those examples of culinary and cultural coexistence that happens here. That doesn't make the paper, it doesn't make the headlines. Everyone, you know, Israelis are trying to pronounce the Arabic names and talk about the different symbols on the jars and the packages. Uh, and Israelis are the second highest consumers of sesame seeds in the world after the Chinese because of tahina. And there's a whole sesame seed market here, kind of like a stock market. And all the best sesame seeds in the world come from er uh, Ethiopia, from a region called Humera, which is a very fertile region along a river. And you know, if there is uh, political unrest in Ethiopia, it makes the news in Israel, not only because of the Ethiopian immigrant community here, but also because they're worried about sesame prices rising. And we are very dependent on our tahina here. So when you get a jar of tahina, what you wanna do is shake it. I'm gonna try and be quiet for a minute and shake so you can hear the sound. <laughs> not only do we hear the sound, but we got a splash. Um, tahina. Sorry, my jar was not closed, but I'm gonna close it and I'm gonna do that again. So we have bloopers today and everything, you guys, amazing. You can hear a little bit of a thud against the top of the jar. If you hear a splash, that means that the oil and the tahina have separated and you have an older jar of tahina. What you're looking for is a better integrated jar of tahina. <laughs> I think I have a little tahina in my hair. Just give me one second to recover. Am I okay here? Um, and I'm gonna show you what the tahina should look like in viscosity. You're looking for something that's sort of akin to a thick pancake batter. Um, and when I'm gonna pour this in front of the camera here, uh, the tahina smoothie calls for a quarter cup and I'm gonna pour it and you're gonna see a really thick, beautiful texture there. Now, I did not put in the full quarter cup. Why? Because I wanted to show you one of my little tricks. These are my new fun little toys. They're called super cubes. They're these silicone trays and I've been freezing my tahina into little two tablespoon portions because the more frozen your smoothie is, the colder it's gonna be and the less watered down. If you freeze everything that goes into your smoothie, you don't have to add ice cubes. Everything is gonna be really concentrated in flavor and delicious. You can use a regular ice cube cube tray. I love these because the stuff pops out. One side I have my precious lime juice because limes are so ephemeral and seasonal in Israel. So I freeze my I lime juice in cubes as well. Um, but these super cubes are wonderful. And the owners are a young Jewish couple in LA who are apparently just on Shark Tank on Friday night and got a really great deal because it's a new company. So check them out. But for my purposes, I just like using the frozen tahina cubes in there. Um, the next ingredient is almond milk. Now, I heard someone mention that they had made this smoothie in advance and they loved how it was dairy-free and gluten-free and all the frees. And what I love about it is it's completely free from, you know, all of the dietary restrictions that many of us have, but it's just so packed with flavor. So you could use coconut milk, you could use almond milk, you can use oat milk. Of course, you can use dairy milk as well, but I truly love using, I use um, my homemade almond milk recipe that's in Sababa here, and I'm adding about two cups to this. And I'm going to add a banana, which I've also sliced and frozen in advance. Um, the banana adds sweetness and thick texture to the smoothie. Uh, which I really, really love. Um, this is about a, a half of a small banana. Um, and then these are medjool dates. Um, if any of you have been to Israel, you know that these are kind of the king of dates here. They're very fudgy. They're very high in sugar content. They're very moist. In fact, I keep them in the fridge because um, they're so high in sugar content that if they sit in a hot cabinet for a long time, they kind of ferment a little bit and the, 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 they turn a little bit Fizzy is the wrong word, but they just kind of, you know, they lose a little bit, the sugar sort of starts to convert. So I like to buy them always with the pits in them. And sometimes I freeze these as well. I didn't get a chance to do that today. The sweeter you want it, the more dates you can add. As you can see, we're adding natural sugars that have lower glycemic index, which is always great. Um, and then I'm also going to add frozen blueberries. So this is Carmel. Carmel is a the, is one, the only Israeli grower of blueberries in Israel. They're in the north. And blueberry season is very short in Israel. And until COVID, almost all of the 
premium blueberries were sold to hotels and resorts and people couldn't get their hands on them. But because of COVID, they started delivering to homes. So my neighbor and I share a bi-weekly delivery of these incredible blueberries from Carmel that are truly some of the best blueberries I've ever had in my life. So I take some of the containers and I throw them right in the freezer to use for my smoothies. And then some of them, I just keep in the fridge to snack on or to use in recipes. Like I'm working on a, a, a lemon blueberry cake with cardamom for my next book. So I keep some in the fridge um, to use for that. Let's see. Now, another thing I always like to do is add salt. Now, did you mind throwing this back in the freezer? Thank you. Um, salt in sweet dishes is really essential. If you've had the tahini smoothie, uh, the tahini shake at Goldie, there's a lot of salt in there. Michael Solomonov knows what he's doing. And Salt brings out the sweetness and lends structure to any dish that you're making, whether it's sweet or savory. So I'm adding pink um, Himalayan salt to my smoothie here. You can use any salt you have, kosher salt. I did a couple of pinches. Um, and then this is uh, my homemade vanilla. Vanilla is very expensive in Israel. So I take vanilla beans, scrape them, put the beans and the pods, everything I scrape back into a bottle, add vodka and let it sit around for a couple of weeks. And then I have homemade vodka that's as good or better than the, the homemade uh, vanilla. That's as good or better as what you get in the store. It has tons of teeny little vanilla bean pods in it. And vanilla is just so delicious in, in the smoothie. So I'm gonna add a little bit of that as well. And then in a previous session, I talked about spices and I just sort of got inspired and I'm gonna add a teeny tiny bit of cardamom to my smoothie today. Um, just to, you know, cardamom and blueberries is actually a classic combination that goes really well together. So I'm gonna do that. And um, now that I think I've gotten all the clean out of my hair, I'm going to blend this thing. Um, and since Purim is this week, I think it's appropriate that we're gonna make a little noise here. So this is my uh, tahini smoothie grogger here. So I'm gonna just turn this on. Now I'm using a bullet style blender. And actually, I think I wanna add, you can add strawberries. If you want extra protein, you can add more tahina or nuts. I'm gonna add a few more blueberries because I really like it when it takes on that gorgeous purple hue. Um, I love this bullet blender. It's like, um, these are the Ninja blenders. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have them. I think they're amazing for salad dressings or sauces. Um, things that you want to emulsify and whip really, really with a lot of air really quickly, making mayonnaise and a little bit less messy than a regular blender. Now, because everything's frozen, um, I can blend it a little bit longer. But one thing when you're making any kind of a smoothie or a shake, you know, you don't want to over blend it because then it starts to warm up. And like, we all like our shakes and smoothies really nice and cold. So I'm going to now take this. Um, I am quite excited to have this for my little four spice here. Um, and I'm going to just put it into a glass. I have a sustainable reusable straw here. And there you have the tahina smoothie using the mother sauce of Israel pure tahina paste. So I am, I'm going to take a sip right now. It's as good as ever, I have to say. <laughs> so thank you. That was fun to make. Um, and great, it's great going to sustain me for the next few hours. So thank you. Fred, I'm not hearing you. I think all of us, I think all of us are very hungry now. And Adina, thank you. By the way, I should mention one thing to you. You know, everyone who's got relatives in Israel has to bring something when they come to Israel that they can't find. <laughs> sure. For my daughter, the standing order is for vanilla. <laughs> and the last time, the last time I came to Israel, I had forgotten to buy it here and we were in Berlin. I spent six hours trudging through <laughs> Berlin to get my daughter go. a half ounce of vanilla. So, you know, so it used, I'm sending yeah. her to you. Next time I'm it sending used, her to you. It used to be in the 80s and the 70s, people would bring aluminum foil and Skippy peanut butter to Israel. You know, those days are long gone. Those Everything is available here. But sometimes, you know, there's a worldwide vanilla shortage because of uh, big storms in Madagascar and political unrest a few years ago, but also now just because of COVID, imports are taking longer and things are pricier. So it yeah. is funny, you know, not traveling as much, like the things that we realize that we take for granted. So thank you, Dad, for supporting <laughs> your daughter's culinary <laughs> I'll send her to you next time. You know, before I ask my first question, I'm going to tell a, a, a quick story, which is apropos of what you just said, but what you couldn't get. One of my earliest memories as a five-year-old 
was when my aunts would visit my grandfather and their sisters in Jerusalem. And before they got on what was then a propeller plane, we used to freeze turkeys in everyone's freezer and they would bring the turkeys on the plane with them because in 1953, people did not have meat in Israel. So how far yeah. should we come? That was <laughs> so, where the, the, the austerity so, so what, 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 early years. So, so fast forward then 10 years later, uh, 20 years later, I'm sorry, to 1973, Adina, which was my mm -hmm. first time in Israel. It was a tough time. It was, the, it was during the Yom Kippur War. But put that uh -huh. aside, I, um, I certainly was, I was there for 10 months and I visited a fair share of restaurants. And there's mm -hmm. one thing that I wrote home about. I said, gee, in an Israeli restaurant, there are three things on the menu, schnitzel, schnitzel, and schnitzel. <laughs> um, um, maybe some of it was turkey, maybe some of it was chicken, but that was it. Right. My next time in Israel, I came and I saw a transformation. And now, of course, when we come to Israel, we see one of the great food cities in the world. Adina, that is true. what happened? Is it is this unique to Israel or is it it's just a worldwide phenomenon? It just seems that is Israeli oh. food is all over our TV. What happened? I think it's a really good question. And I do think it's something that's unique to Israel. Uh, with all due respect to a lot of other cultures, I haven't seen Portuguese food break out or um, you know, Swedish food in the way that Israeli food has. And I think that they're a confluence of events contributed to this phenomenon. And I like to say that, you know, it was a, a minute that became a movement. And I think that there are a lot of dishes in the modern Israeli cooking repertoire that are going to become part of our permanent culinary canon in the United States. I mean, who would have thought that five years ago, you could get a shakshuka kit in Trader Joe's or that you could get bamba <laughs> or that you could get, right. you know, a schug, the Yemenite hot sauce in the refrigerator case. Um, I think it all goes back to, you know, in the 1990s um, and 80s, the mark of a great Israeli chef was somebody who could cook French food, Italian food, American food, or other continental food uh, as well as possible. It showed that Israel was a poor country. They were well-traveled. They were sophisticated. They, they, you know, they had, to, you know, touch the stars. And then, you know, the world changed. The internet came upon us. Food media really exploded. Um, Israel became a wealthier country. Young Israelis started traveling around the world, tasting all the flavors of, of the Far East, India, South America, the United States. And a lot of them went to work in um, Michelin star restaurants in, in all over Europe and all over the world. And I think what happened around 2000 or so is that these young Israelis went to France and they saw the French making very simple food that was just coaxing as much flavor as they could out of their local ingredients. And they sort of, you know, I think, you know, a little, you know, light bulbs went off and they said, hey, wait a minute, you know, we have the best olive oil in the world. We have incredible produce. We have immigrants from a hundred countries around the world that create this fantastic dialectical melting pot of food. Well, I got to go home and, and, and celebrate my own Moroccan culture, my own um, Tunisian culture, my own Ethiopian culture, and I got to bring something new to the table and I want to blend it all together and celebrate everything that I have right here. So I think that's really when about 10, 12 years ago, things really started to change. People came home and used what they had in Israel and, and used all the skills and the globalism that they had adapted by traveling and new things started appearing that were healthy and produce forward and very plant Based, which was very exciting for people and full of bright, spicy, lemony flavor. And it just kind of took off, you know, and also Israelis are so entrepreneurial. They'll, they'll take something, throw it against the wall and see what sticks, you know. And the same is true of food. They'll try anything, you know, here, you know, Mise Known, which is now an international brand of, of pita, stuffed, stuffed pita sandwiches by Chef Ayal Shani, you know, who started out with a little place on King George in Tel Aviv, our mm -hmm. Ibn Gavi roll. And, you know, he revolutionized pita. Pita was something that people used to be afraid to put a, a juicy sandwich into because everything would drip out all over your shirt. So he re-engineered the pita itself to be a really delicious, crenellated, amazing, almost crumpet-like pocket that you could stuff anything into. And now people all over the world are doing that because of the influence of this one person. So that's just one example of the, the exciting, experimental things that happen here that also touch upon many different cultures and influences in Israel. Also, I can, I can picture how you have to, I'm not going to 
do this too much, how do you have to hold that in front of you? Yeah, we do the thing, same thing with our cheesesteaks in Philadelphia. Right. You have to sort of oh, get yeah. into a crouch to be able oh, exactly. to exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know. During, um, in her sermon on Friday night, Rabbi Maderer reminded us that um, diversity is a source of strength. And you touched on this in the answer you just gave, but, but I'm wondering, um, there are some of us, most of us on this call, I'm sure, are from an Ashkenazi background, but there are yeah. so many Israelis who come from a Mizrahi background. Sure. In, in the culinary world, was there a fusion of those two? Did one tend to sort of dominate over the other? Was this a, a, something that came together in Israel as a, with these two very different cultural traditions? So I might... Uh... I might advance the theory that the reason that you used to think schnitzel, schnitzel, schnitzel was because in the early, in the early years of the state, the state was founded by Ashkenazi Jews from Eastern Europe. And mm -hmm. some of them were intent on recreating the culture and the food of their native land. Um, and, you know, Mizrahi immigrants from, you know, Sephardic and Mizrahi immigrants from North Africa and the Middle East did have a harder time adjusting and um, ascending in Israeli culture until the 1970s and 1980s when um, Mizrahi culture and pride in Mizrahi culture really started to take center stage in Israel. And that also has a lot to do with the improvement of the Israeli food scene. I mean, when you think of uh, German Jewish food, how many spices, how many spices are we talking about? How many vegetables, how many, you know, how much lemon, you know, all those essential You're things. You're lucky if you get salt cooking. and pepper. Yeah. Right, so, so it's a lot of it had to do with people saying, hey, wait a minute, we, we make up half the country here and we have this incredible Jewish heritage that goes back thousands of years. And, you know, it was in a way connected to, like many things in Israel happened about 10, happen, things happen sometimes 10 years later or so, you know, um, you know, equal rights um, efforts in the United States for Black and African American people. You know, the same thing was true here. People asserting themselves and saying, hey, we're equal here. Every, we have culture to offer. We have um, history to offer. And we, we want to have a seat at the table, literally. Mm -hmm. And that is part of what happened here. And Chaim Cohen, who was sort of the first, um, one of the first gourmet Israeli chefs is from a Mizrahi background. And he had a huge influence, as did television, you know, the commercialization of Israeli TV, the programmers looked at who their audience was and realized that they needed to cater to another, no pun intended, <laughs> of the audience in front of them. And you know, if, if the country is 50% Mizrahi, they're gonna wanna see their own food and culture represented in, in television. And I think that that was a wonderful development. And now, you know, when you go to an Israeli grill restaurant, you're gonna have this huge spread of salatim oh, or salad oh, that you all, sorry. you know, but that's really, you know, that table of salatim is a microcosm of Israeli culture. You're going to have chopped liver with eggs and onions next to a Moroccan carrot salad, next to a Russian potato salad, next to um, an aioli from, you know, from France. So all those things come together and all of us, and, you know, Israelis, although they're very aware of where dishes come from and they honor that provenance, there is this just sort of seamless blending that goes on. And I would say that the pita is the through line that sort of connects all of it by dipping and spreading and sharing and, you know, swiping as we call it. So yeah, I think mean, okay. broccoli food is really important and it continues to be. Let me ask you a sort of a, just an extension of that question. So uh -huh. one of my best memories from my first trip to Israel, I remember in, uh, this was must have been about this time of the year in 1974, I was visiting a cousin in Haifa whose, um, whose husband, who was Bulgarian born and was Sephardic, about almost about midnight or so, came into me, said, hey, you want to sneak away somewhere with me? And he took me down to the Merkaz in Haifa, where we ate in an Arab restaurant and uh, yeah. was I mean I was in heaven in heaven I remember writing home about it how much how much of an influence has Arab food had on Israeli food and is this a way for the Jews and uh, Palestinians Jews and um, and Muslims to come together so to speak in Israel 
the influence is undeniable and worthy of celebration. Um, sababa is actually an Arab word. It means, uh, sababa in Arabic means the highest form of love or admiration. And it's mm -hmm. been uh, adapted by Israelis to mean everything's cool, everything's great. Um, you know, you can't talk about Israeli food without talking about Arab food. And, and while I will say I'm a little tired of the arguments about who, to whom hummus and falafel and shawarma belong to, mm -hmm. right, you know, right. I think that if we want to have real deep conversations, we have to move past those simplicities and get and get deeper and just sit at the mm -hmm. table and talk to one another. But yes, there is no denying even just the whole idea of baladi. Baladi vegetables are sort of heirloom or rustic or country mm -hmm. preparations of things like eggplant and and stuffed things. Those a lot of those things come from the Arab kitchen. And um, earlier I talked about the influence of the Galilee and the Galilean kitchen and the whole Levantine region on the north of Israel. And, you know, 20%, more than 20% of Israel's population is made up of Israeli Arabs, many of whom now identify as Palestinian. So the lines are blurred there. And those foods are now being acknowledged and celebrated. And I do believe that they can be a vehicle for more dialogue although it is complicated. It's not as simple as let's all break bread yeah. together and solve all of our problems. There are challenges for uh, Arabs and Palestinians about cooperating with Israelis, um, frowned upon sometimes. Um, but within Israel, there are amazing Arab restaurants that all of us go to, um, learn from, cook from. There's an amazing uh, female Israeli uh, Arab chef named Nof Atamna, and she won Master Chef which is the most popular show on Israeli TV. Um, and she is a doctor, a medical doctor who was an amateur cook and who wowed Israel with her incredible preparations. And now she has one of the most followed Instagram food accounts in Israel and she's super popular and people are excited about her food and influenced by her. And you do see these things happening aided and assisted by media and social media for sure. Thank you. you know, one of our um, one of our participants has noted ask you to talk about, but I think you just have uh, the um, the incredible diversity of those people who are seen eating in Yaffa at any given time in restaurants. It's just um, hopefully yeah. Uh, yes. Jaffa is you know right now obviously no restaurants have outdoors have have seating. Um, mm -hmm. Just today, Israel finally relaxed a lot of its COVID. Uh, regulations. Uh, the swimming pool that I attend reopened. Um, front front facing stores have opened today. Um, I downloaded my green passport last night, which is my mm -hmm. proof of double vaccination. Um, but the restaurant industry is one of the industries that has really suffered here. Um, they received very little government assistance. Um, and many restaurateurs are just mom and pop shops. You know, they're not all very sophisticated um, with a lot of communication uh, vehicles. So I'm hoping and praying that the industry can roar back. I mean, Israelis are ready to eat out and obviously we're ready for you all to come visit. It's been very strange to not have American friends and friends from all over the world visiting and, and partaking. And, and you know, the, it's that, that back and forth, that sharing um, that we all get excited about that has really been missing for me in the last year. Well, Adina, we have a we have a deal for you. Next time you come to Philadelphia, our congregants will take you to our Reading Terminal Market and our Italian oh, Market, and you take us to the markets, the open air markets in Tel Aviv. That'll be a, a home and home, as we call it. My um, pleasure, my pleasure. One one of our um, one of our participants asked, "What if any is the effect of kashrut on the Israel restaurant scene? Is it is it playing okay, any good role?" Question. Is, mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, Israel is really a tale of two cities, I would say, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. You know, there's a real um, divide between the two, culturally, religiously, geographically, weather, everything. Um, in Jerusalem, most restaurants are kosher. In Tel Aviv, until about 10 years ago, it was hard to find kosher restaurants unless they were traditional restaurants serving falafel shawarma um, and schnitzel. But uh, several factors have influenced that. Um, a lot of French immigrants in Israel keep kosher, even if they're not necessarily ritually observant. Um, more and more Israelis actually have been keeping kosher, um, and there are more religious people in Israel than there were decades ago. So, And because of the number, huge number of tourists that come from the United States and other places that keep kosher, restaurants, good kosher restaurants 
exist that did not exist 10 years ago. But that being said, in Tel Aviv, you can find every rule breaking <laughs> ingredient um, in copious amounts. And also, you know, the Russian uh, community really impacted the culinary scene here. Um, um, over a million people from the former Soviet Union arrived sure. um, in the late 80s, early 90s, and continue to arrive. And, you know, they celebrate Novigod, which is kind of a form of Christmas. They eat bacon, they eat pork, uh, Teeb Tom, which is a very successful supermarket chain that has a whole uh, butcher counter selling all kinds of white meat, as they call it in Israel. Um, you know, in Israel, there is pork raised in Israel, but in order to appease the rabbinical authorities here, they made a deal that the um, the pigs are raised are are raised on raised wooden platforms so that they don't actually ever touch Israeli soil. Just an interesting little <laughs> piece of trivia fact. But so there's there's a whole range. There's I would say there's the kosher more kosher than there ever has been, and more trafe as we call it than there's ever been. Like Israel, everything is is an extreme. I, I love your example of of other ways <laughs> for what a, a, a typical <laughs> a compromise. So you know, here's sort of a fine tuned um, point on that question. So. This year, I know we're entering that one in every seven year period called the Shemitah, in uh -huh. which technically you're not supposed to um, uh, have a harvest from your land. I remember once being in Israel during a Shemitah year when in a, in a, in a hotel for breakfast, I can only get canned fruits and vegetables. What do people like you or what does the restaurant seem do during the Shemitah? Can you get fresh fruits and vegetables? You can. Um... I mean, the advice of, I don't purchase my produce from a kosher uh, vendor. You know, you would think vegetables, why do they need to be kosher? But in Jerusalem, almost every vendor in the uh, Machane Yehuda market has a kosher certification. A, which means that they're all observed the Sabbath, but B, that it means that they observe the rules of Shemitah, which for those of you who aren't familiar, um, has to do with um, holding back on uh, land and also not growing things that's um, on a seven year cycle and also um, giving offerings uh, from the land and all different kinds of things. But, um, you know, there's an idea of orla, which is young produce that you're not supposed to buy. So there are, uh, as with everything, there are rabbinical ways to get around um, Shemitah prohibitions, but certain fruits and vegetables are like things like carrots, potatoes, onions, um, apples are often cellared for a long time, you know, and sometimes they rely on you know, there, there are all different kinds of runarounds, actually, but like people, do, people do buy fresh produce here. What we you know. is there are workarounds. So let's go now from the macro, the Israeli scene to the micro, talk a little bit about you. One of sure. our congregants has, understands that you spent time as a cooking intern with a Druze family. <laughs> um, I, I, I wasn't an intern, but, you know, in the course of my research for Skababa, I cooked with people from many cultures and it was the greatest privilege and something that I'm hoping to continue to do with my Shabbat book. Um, so yes, I went up north to Yarka, which is mm -hmm. um, a Druze village. Um, and there are many uh, women who uh, run home hospitality there where they teach and cook and host meals. Um, and, you know, Druze have a, a whole unique religious um, tradition, they believe in um, that, you know, the souls of those uh, beloved who are passed um, are reincarnated in the bodies of, of living people, often children. Um, and the woman, uh, Zarafat, that I had cooked with her husband, who had been a newscaster, had died uh, three years before, but they believed that his soul had transmogrified into one of the children in the family. So that was just an interesting fact. But um, mm -hmm. Um, everything that we made at her home was was from her land. She had her own olive trees. She pressed. She brought her olives to an olive press to have the olive oil made. She grew all of her own herbs. She made her own the best tomato paste I ever had in my life. Um, she boiled down like huge pots of tomatoes into what's called dibes. Dibes means anything concentrated. So like saba, which is grape must, or balsamic vinegar is a form of dibes. Anything concentrated. So. Um, what I was really struck by when cooking with uh, Drew's women was their high, high level of culinary proficiency, like making incredibly wafer thin bread on these incredible ovens. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the spicing, very, very precise spicing and very specific rules, unlike modern Israeli cooking, like they have more sort of, I would say, a French brigade type 
um, approach to cooking. Like you put these kinds of spices and these kinds of dishes and these kinds of amounts. And I found that all the food was very clarion clear in its flavors and very bright and very special and very unique. I think because of the rules that they follow and the simplicity, but the, the depth because of all the spices and, and the amazing uh, raw ingredients that they use. So that was, you know, I cooked a few dishes with different Arab and Palestinian chefs. I um, also cooked with someone from Akko, a young um, Arab Palestinian chef named Osama Dalal, whose family is a family of fishermen from Jaffa. And he grew up in Jaffa, um, going out and getting fresh fish. And he taught me how to make an amazing uh, fish in yogurt sauce, Leban Emo, that's in the book as well. Um, but he, as a more integrated Arab Israeli, he, you know, uh, was creating ruse with flour and incorporating heavy cream to make the sauce hold together and adding special spices and doing things in a different way. So it really spoke to the wide variety of experiences of mine and also just of Arab and Palestinian populations in Israel who are both traditional and modern, just like Jews in Israel, you know, the same, right. the same story, different people, same story. <laughs> Adina, tell us a little bit, what was it about Israel? Here you are clearly you know, uh, cooking is your life. You've won, uh, uh, written or co-written some of these wonderful cookbooks. What attracted you to Israel? What brought you in 2018 to, did you make Aliyah in 2018? Was it actually? I made Aliyah. Um, I was raised in a, a modern Orthodox Jewish home in Palo Alto, California. And we were very Israel-centric in our approach to life. Uh, I was raised in Zionist youth movements. I came to Israel on vacations and spent a gap year here after college and actually lived in Israel for five years after college and lived in Jerusalem. And that was when I first sort of, even though I grew up in Northern California where one would think that, you know, it was this platonic ideal of Alice Waters style cooking. You know, I was, we were, we were cooking like everyone else, frozen vegetables, garlic powder and margarine. You know, it was the 1970s for God's sake. Um, <laughs> And I got to Israel after college and, you know, I asked for avocado in a sandwich out of season and, you know, the, the, the waiter almost, you know, had a heart attack. And like, that was when I first learned that avocados were a seasonal produce, as were mangoes or limes. And I would go to the shuk and be so transfixed by how the seasons interacted with the Jewish holidays as well, you know, um, I'm no longer religious, but what I love about ritually observant, I am very connected to my religion, but um, I love how in the States, if you ask someone when a pomegranate is at its peak, they'll say late September and here they'll say rough, right around Rosh Hashanah time. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of, you know, different vegetables have different connections to the Jewish calendar and all those just fun ways that living in Israel, you know, and being culturally Jewish is so uh, mixed into my food life as well. So as I got interested in uh, food writing, Israeli food also started to kind of take shape and my career and Israeli food kind of advanced mm -hmm. in lockstep together. And I started writing a lot about food and wine here. And I eventually met a really nice guy named Jay Shofet, who I married six, I met him six and a half years ago and we married three and a half years ago in Tel Aviv. And he, uh, wanted to stay here. He has lived here for 35 years, even though he's American. And I always felt the pull of life in Israel and was very attracted to the idea of living in Tel Aviv. And it's worked out incredibly well. I have had, had friends here from my previous uh, experiences living here. I've made a lot of friends in the food community. Um, Sababa only happened because I was living in Israel and I, I had been asked to write Israeli cookbooks in the past, but always felt a little bit like I would be a bit of a dilettante or an interloper if I weren't living in Israel. Mm -hmm. And once I landed here and Jay found us this apartment right by the Shook, everything just kind of came into, you know, clear focus for me. And I knew what I could, you know, I'm very good friends with Michael mm -hmm. and I know a lot of the other Israeli chefs and I only wanted to write a book if I could add something to this incredible conversation that's been going on about Israeli food. And what I realized that I can add was my perspective through the lens of an American living in Israel. You know, Michael is the opposite. He's an Israeli-ish living in America, as a lot of the chefs are who are helping advance the Israeli food movement and share its bounty. But here I am, this American woman with culinary background and a love of Israel living in the market. And I felt like that was how I could share something unique through my very personal story. And stepping outside of co-authoring and finding my own voice and writing Sababa really brought it all together for me. And it's been so gratifying to see people cooking from the book and also loving the writing. You know, that's mm -hmm. been so fun for me to see people read the book um, and feel 
transported to Israel through its pages. Um, you know, um, a couple of people have asked, how long does it take to write a book like Sababa? Is it a compilation <laughs> of years worth of recipes and all? Or do you just sit down one day and just say, here it is, I'm going to write? So I would say, you know, there some people have a treasure trove of recipes that they've been collecting for decades and, the, and they put it together. Maybe it takes less time. It took me a full year working full time, start to finish to write my book, including cooking, testing, photographing with an amazing creative team, um, going to people's homes. It can take any, I think the minimum to write a good book is a year and it can mm -hmm. take 10 years, <laughs> depending on how <laughs> focused you are. Um, but Sababa, I, you know, I got the book contract in early January 17 and then I got engaged and married. So I deferred <laughs> uh, my manuscript do. a little <laughs> bit. So I, so I really worked on it in earnest from about June 17 to, you know, finished, sent off to the printer in June 18. And then it came out about four months later because all books are printed overseas now because it's less expensive and sent over on boats because of okay. the weight. So, yeah. yeah. And you know, I'm sort of working backwards how you got to Israel when the book, how did you get into food and culinary and writing? Have you been doing this all your adult life? Have you been, has this been a passion uh, of yours? I've always loved cooking. Uh, my mother was a wonderful cook. She, my mother grew up in a non, a uh, very secular Jewish home and also a not food loving home. And she married my father who was an Orthodox Jew when she was quite young. They met on a blind date. He needed a date for a college event and someone, conjured up my mother and they fell in love. So my mother learned how to cook and to cook Jewish at the same time. And, you know, the two books that I still possess that were hers were the New York Times cookbook by Craig Claiborne and the Spice and Spirit Lubavitch cookbook. So that gives you sort of an example of the duality of my culinary upbringing. So because we were religious in a very uh, small community, we, we constantly were hosting guests and we made everything for Shabbat by ourselves. Our mother worked, so she recruited us to help her. Everything from plucking the frozen kosher chickens that we got once a month from Chicago to making challah, making all the soups and desserts because we couldn't buy anything. So I had a very high comfort level in the kitchen. And as I got older, I just loved traveling and getting to know people. And I felt like cooking was an amazing way to very quickly make inroads into other cultures. Um, and I thought about briefly going to culinary school after high school, but I was a nice Jewish girl who was an honor student. So, you know, college, <laughs> college, college back in, I went to college um, and I ended up going to culinary school almost 15 years later. Mm -hmm. But um, as I got older and really zeroed in on my passion and figuring out a way to combine cooking and publishing, which was always my goal, um, I made my way to cookbook writing about 11 years ago and writing all those other books with other people on their behalf and in conjunction with them really, um, prepared me for this next phase in my career. Well, on a personal note, I, also you mentioned the gap year. I can tell you from experience, our family <laughs> had a daughter who took a gap year in Israel. I haven't seen her since, at least not permanently. Since, so. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. I, I, I will say, um, you know, um, a couple of people have said that, um, you know, it's, we're going we're gonna to celebrate Purim with our school children right after this sure. event, the Purim this sure. week. And so I, you know, I don't mean to put you on the spot in any way, so, uh, but um, I, we've told some of our patrons that for a little bit extra, you stay around for an hour and a half and bake us a commentation, but I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> if I could, if I could FedEx them to you, I would happily bring them over. Well, you and I but have I already made say... that deal on the olives from the market. So I, I'm still no waiting problem. for a Federal Express delivery of the olives. So I'll tell the you- The trend um, this year is, is marbled, marbled hamantaschen, mixing chocolate dough and hamantaschen. vanilla dough. So Google that everyone, you can make some great marbled hamantaschen. Uh, very, very nice. So. Um, uh, one last question comes from um, one of our um, one of our uh, leaders in the congregation. I won't identify who that person is. If one of our patrons wants to make an additional contribution, I will reveal that person's name. But the question <laughs> is, how do you keep your stove so clean? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a little bit of tahina droplets on there based on At my little bit so nice. of <laughs> But um, I, uh, I don't know. I have a new kitchen and I'm very intent on keeping it clean, um, much more than I was before. So um, it's been, it's a pleasure to cook in Israel. And now I feel like I have a kitchen that enables me to, you know, 
try anything I want um, and living so close to the market. It's just, it's a wonderful, I hope to see you all here in Israel. And, well, you make us you know, all jealous and, you know, hoping when this is all over, we'll get there. I certainly have, you know, I, I've got a trip scheduled whenever this ends, you know, not, not on the books yet, not my ticket yet, but we will. At the end, you have been absolutely wonderful in um, letting Thank us into, into your kitchen. Um, the lighting is beautiful. We've been able to <laughs> see everything, hear you wonderfully. Um, You've Wonderful. made all of us hungry. I know the sun is going down in um, in Tel Aviv right now, but for us it's yes. brunch time, and so I think that's um, <laughs> for us we're going to be. But I can't thank you enough for joining us and and allowing us to participate and to meet you and to share in your experiences. So thank you. You've really um, uh, it's been a, a great contribution and a great a great hour to spend with you here with thank uh, the you. It was Shalom. My treat and my pleasure and honor. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy Purim. And I wish everyone health and an ex a safe and speedy exit from the last year. And we're waiting for all of you here in Israel. We will, and, and our deal stands. We'll do a home and home. We'll bring you to our markets. So take care. Wonderful. All right, bye-bye. Before, bye -bye. before everyone goes, I just want to say thank you, Adina. Thank you, Fred and point out that as this is the second event in our four philanthropic programs, I wanna be sure you know that we have a few more available so we can connect with each other. In just two weeks, join award-winning chef, Julia Tertian, and, and you know, um, Adina, thank you because it's a fireside chat and marble loaf cooking demo. And she's going to take us through her favorite childhood Jewish recipes and her quest for equity at the table. Her she's mom, wonderful. She's her wonderful. Thank you. Her mom, Rochelle Udell Tertian, will also participate talking about the legacy of food in her family. She is the best selling author of critically acclaimed cookbooks, including Now and Again Feed the Resistance and Small Victories. She hosts a podcast keep calm and cook on, and is the founder of Equity at the Table, an inclusive digital directory of women and non-binary individuals in food. Then on Sunday, May 2nd, we welcome back Michael Solomonov to Road of Shalom to hear his story of addiction and recovery. After Michael's story, there will be a panel discussion moderated by our congregant Colleen Barry, chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, featuring Richard Roisman, the Karen Board of Trustees member, and Dr. Tom Scott, a pain management specialist. Please sign up on our website if you have not yet RSVP'd. And for those, just a little clarification with children in Berkman Merkaz Lamoud, today is the BML Purim celebration. For adults, the program is on Thursday. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your weekend.